good morning. Still, okay, yeah, it's still morning. <laughs> um, so hopefully some of you guys were here for Don's talk, because I think that was a really nice introduction macro level to IoT. I'm going to overlap a little bit with his talk, but we're going to dive in straight to the micro level of um, Laura and Laura Wan and, um, and what the use cases are for, um, for that application. And of course, IoT platforms. Um, I spent five years in IoT so far. I have a lot of opinions on IoT platforms, so we'll spend some time on that. Okay, so um, this is what we're going to go over. We're going to get into, into some deep, a little bit of RF, a little bit of, uh, of LoRaWAN uh, protocol. Um, but let's talk with wh why are we even talking about IoT? And I, again, if you were at Don's talk, the hype is real. And I have, I have my own curve listed here. So Don had the 2011. This is the 2018 curve. And notice that we've progressed. Um, over here at the peak of inflated expectations for IoT where you get connected salt shakers. Um, but we are well on our way down this lovely slope into the trough of disillusionment, um, probably where that poor lock company finds themselves today. So um, it, there are a lot of companies investing in IoT, whether or not they call it that. So KP, uh, sorry, KPMG has done a study recently of 750 technology leaders and their top three things that will change their business are robotics, AI, and IoT at the very top. So it's interesting to see that they think that this will have the greatest business transformation and drive the greatest benefit to life, society, and the environment. It's pretty heavy, but um, it's a lot of responsibility to, for uh, companies involved in IoT to take on, but I think it's, it's heading in that direction. We can, we can now, we have the ability with the low cost hardware and all of the infrastructure that's going up everywhere, we literally have the ability to connect anything. But why is it really relevant to the audience here? So connected to the internet, how many devices, you'll see that 25 billion devices predicted by Cisco by 2022. Um, it's important to the audience here because it's a new skill set that has to be developed for software engineers to power these devices. So you maintain the skill set for smart, um, smartphone applications and uh, web and all of these traditional skill sets, but you have to expand the software development skill set to apply to the devices, the device portion of this, which design has to change to be able to run these devices. It has to be elegant. It has to be efficient. You cannot use infinite resources. You have infinite resources in the cloud, but on these devices, especially if they're running on battery, you're very limited resources. And you have to be very mindful of the code that you write such that it doesn't abuse the very little amount of resources that you have. OK, so we're going to start diving deep into low power networks. So I have a couple of diagrams just to show you, visually give you an idea of the differences between these protocols. It's really important that you choose the right protocol for your application. Um, the title of this talk is that they're not created equal, and they certainly are not created equal, but they all have use cases. There is no single solution for every connected product. Um, a really good analogy is modes of transportation. You use a bicycle to get short distances, you use a car to get city to city or state to state, and you get on an airplane to go across the world. You're not going to pick one mode of transportation and stick to it for everything that you do. Same with IoT. You're not going to pick a single protocol for everything that you want to connect. You will pick, pick the, the right protocol, protocol for the application. So just looking at this very quickly, things you're familiar with, Wi-Fi, great amount of bandwidth, doesn't go very far. You know, you, you walk out of the Sheraton and your Wi-Fi connection is going to evaporate within feet. Um, but you can stream video high quality video. Cellular, again, mission critical, really highly connected protocol, but it's high power. You're, you're 
going to recharge the battery on those cellular devices once or multiple times per day. And then you've got LoRa and other LPWAN technologies where you get a significant amount of range, but your trade-off is the bandwidth. You're not going to be spending megabytes or even kilobytes of data on something like LoRa. You're going to be sending very small messages, but you can get them well across a, a large geography, whether you're, and you're measuring that in kilometers. Um, because, because it started in Europe, you're measuring kilometers, not miles. And so uh, as much as 10 kilometers advertised, uh, though I've known a few folks to uh, reach Doylestown from Philadelphia with their devices, and uh, off the record, maybe somebody forgot to turn off a LoRa device when they got on an airplane, and we were getting signal at 30,000 feet. So that's pretty cool. Another great illustration, just this three-dimensional graph to show you, again, bandwidth versus range versus battery life, where two very common technology, well, one very common and one emerging technology really lie. And then this one's my favorite, this last one, that compares on this multi-dimensional graph things that are really important across all connected products. So power consumption. Again, we talked about cellular, Zigbee's up there. And uh, so bandwidth, you're going to get a lot more with cellular than you will with something like Zigbee. Uh, the cost of radio chipsets, radio subscription costs, and number of base stations is really interesting. So now you're talking infrastructure. Notice that LP WAN number of base stations is really low. So that reduces your cost of deployment very significantly, where things like 5G, you need a base station every couple hundred feet, I believe, um, and it's obstructed by leaves on trees. Um, that is not the case for LP WAN, but at the same time, the lightning speed you get with 5G is not the lightning speed you get with LP WAN. Notice that the transmission latency is fairly high comparatively here. So lots of trade-offs, lots of options. Okay, so diving a little bit deeper, LoRa means, LoRa is a, a, a acronym for long range. And how does LoRa uh, get to have that long range? Well, it operates in the 915 megahertz band in the United States. It's very regionally dependent. And it has a really clever modulation scheme, and we'll look at that um, in a little bit. It can run on small batteries for we say up to 10 years, that's highly dependent on your design, but the advertised LP WAN battery life is five to 10, some people even say 20 years. I'd be hard pressed to find a technology that's gonna be around for 20 years to require that level of battery life, but that's marketing. Um, and how do we do, how do we, get, how do we do that? How do we get 10 years out of a battery? You're gonna have really small packet sizes, you're gonna have really small listening windows. These devices are really, they're sleepy devices as they are in um, Zigbee, for instance, with infrequent transmissions. So that means that if a device transmits a couple times a day, that's fairly normal for an LPWAN implementation. Um, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna transmit every minute or every second. That's just not the right application for this technology. And what I mean by sleepy devices is that you cannot address a device. A device has to speak to the network first and then opens up a receive window to get some downstream message. So that's how you get to these crazy battery life numbers uh, because you're, you're not getting perpetual connectivity. And then low cost. We talked about um, very inexpensive microcontrollers. The bill material adder to a device is a, anywhere from 3 to $10 depending on what components you choose and how uh, sophisticated you want your LoRa implementation to be. That's really cheap, three to ten dollars. These, they're really, at the three dollar point, you're really looking at disposable sensors at this point. Um, and what's, what we also talked about, again, just keep in mind, a lightweight protocol, so the infrastructure is going to be really um, inexpensive, comparatively speaking, to something like um, cellular. Um, Okay. okay, so alluded a little bit to the fact that LoRa and LoRaWAN are different things. So 
let's just discuss nomenclature real quick. So LoRa is an RF modulation technique, which is the intellectual property of a company called Semtech. It was developed in France some years ago, and that's, that's what LoRa is. It's a modulation technique. And it uses something called CHIRP protocol. This is not a new technology. CHIRP spread spectrum was uh, around in World War II and used in sonar and radar applications. The trick with LoRa is just the intelligent application of that modulation. So LoRa has these things called spreading factors that are essentially the duration of this CHIRP. And you'll see what a CHIRP looks like in the bottom left, oh, sorry, bottom right there for you. So that's an up chirp that you're looking this way and a down chirp in the opposite direction. And so the, what spreading factors allow you to do is increase your range. So let's do an analogy. If everyone in this room were to stand up and start having conversations, you have a certain noise level in the room. And my distance to the person with whom I'm trying to communicate will determine what spreading factor I use for my communication. So that means how quickly will I speak to that person? So if they're standing right next to me in a crowded room, I can speak fairly quickly. That's my spreading factor seven. I'm not spreading out my words too much. But if that person is well across the other side of the room and I'm speaking at the same volume, I'm gonna get far less words in the same amount of time trying to communicate to the other side of the room. So the spreading factor of your signal really depends on how good is the connectivity between you and the receiving party. So a gateway, for instance, will know how well it heard a device. So if they try to communicate on spreading factor seven and they're either, they're, they're getting a pretty crappy signal to noise ratio and a pretty crappy uh, signal integrity number, that gateway is gonna send a message to the device to say, change your spreading factor, slow down, so I can better hear your messages. And that's how you maintain the integrity of that packet. So this makes LoRa really resilient to noise. Number one problem in wireless technology, I think, is, is noise and just a really noisy environment, especially when we're talking uh, about just streaming everything in the world. Um, the other secret to that is that um, LoRa uses the 900 megahertz spectrum, so it stays away from the very crowded 2.4, 5 gigahertz, just the, the very ubiquitous um, frequencies that, that most devices are using these days. Um, but again, it's very regionally dependent. In the United States, we use the 915, so that's the 902 to 928, pick the middle um, to, to represent it. So the 915 band, where in Europe they use 868, in, um, in parts of Asia they're in the 400s. So LoRa, th th sorry, the ISM band, so the spectrum that is unlicensed varies across the globe as to where that is. So the LoRa implementation will vary regionally uh, based on that. That actually complicates things a lot. If you think about your device and wanting to be lean and mean because you don't have a lot of resources, that's a lot to account for if you want to have global deployments. Okay. So, I just throw this up there for the US band. You'll see the different, the different spreading factors. So just to give you an idea of what you're looking at. So I, data rates tend to be a little bit confusing, but spreading factor seven, if you look at the middle there, you're looking at um, 250 byte total payload. Does anybody in this room still think in bytes? <laughs> So you're, you're at, but most likely if you're in spreading factor 10 or 11, you're looking at 19 or what we're functioning in at machine Q, 11 bytes, 11 bytes of data. So you're getting temperature, humidity, and not a lot else <laughs> in that one payload. So um, the reason I bring this up is again, the application for this technology is going to be very specific. 
Okay, so now let's shift a little bit. So this is the device software stack, and we talked a little bit about that bottom piece, the physical piece, the LoRa modulation. So LoRaWAN is the layer above that. It is the protocol. It is the specification of how you communicate over this RF. We'll dive a little bit in here into some of the interesting pieces about LoRaWAN. Um, your device can function in three different operating modes or classes. Class A is the most standard. That's going to be your most efficient and effective battery life. And maybe I'll, I'll get this one. Um, most efficient and, uh, and effective battery life because it, um, it only transmits at a preset interval. So you can do it that you transmit once an hour. Um, you can make it such that you do a little bit of processing on device and you only transmit when something changes, like my temperature went over 75 degrees, send a packet. Um, and that's going to be your most efficient way of conserving battery. However, that device is not addressable. So if you want to, say, update a parameter on that device. You have to wait for it to transmit before you can do that. If you want to just know whether or not it's connected, you have to wait for it to transmit. So that is a really, um, it's a challenging place to be, but it's the most efficient place to be. I'll hop down to Class C. Class C, you can actually get connected, uh, so power connected devices are perfectly legitimate on LoRa. It doesn't have to be a battery-powered device. And these devices are constantly listening, so they're much more easily addressable, updatable. Um, applications for this would be something like streetlights. So City of Philadelphia actually has LoRa-enabled lights at uh, Dilworth Park and at Love Park. And so they're in Class C mode because they're wired, so there's no reason to go into Class A mode. And you can turn the lights on and off as you see fit. And the reason that LoRa is a really good application for that is that it, it, you can cover the entire city with just a handful of gateways. And in fact, there's one on top of Comcast Center. There's a couple of strand mount gateways sprinkled throughout the city, and we've got ubiquitous coverage over the whole city. Then there's Class B, which is, I won't go too deeply into this one. This is really complicated. This is like an engineer's dream of a class, somebody mega over-engineered Class B. So Class B highly depends on super accurate clocks because it works on a beaconing system such that um, it synchronizes perfectly, opens up millisecond windows, listening windows, and the gateway has to be precisely in sync with that to send down a message. And so this is kind of that middle ground of I'm conserving power, but I'm still addressable at very specific predetermined times. But to get very specific predetermined times, you need GPS level clock synchronization. And it, the reason I say I, I find it to be so over engineered is just that's kind of goes against the purpose of LoRaWAN and being very simple and, and thin and light, but it's there. If you wanted to implement class B mode, um, that is a challenge in hardware, in software, in networking. If anybody wants a really difficult, interesting project, I propose that you go try to implement Class B on a device um, and do something interesting like over-the-air updates using Class B. It's a very um, interesting exercise. So that's, let's go back a little bit. So that's the modes of operation of a LoRa device. And above that is the application. So what does your device actually do? We'll get a little bit into this probably in the platform section. But one of the things that I think is true across all wireless protocols, and more so in LoRa than anything else, and this goes back to the software engineer's skill set, your application has to be really mindful of the protocol. So going back to the fact that these devices run on very, very cheap MCUs, these are single-threaded devices. 
They cannot do multiple things at once. And as I mentioned, uh, Laura depends on timing for downlink messages to the device. So let's say that um, a device transmits its packets and the network server has some information to pass down to it, whatever that may be, a change of configuration, for instance. So the device transmits a packet, it waits a second, and then it opens a receive window. If it doesn't hear a preamble from the network server, it closes that receive window, waits another second, opens another receive window. That timing is really critical. This MCU is sitting there counting 0 to 60, opens a window, counts for how long that window is open, closes the window, counts how long to wait to the next window. If your application throws in an interrupt in the middle of that, I've decided that I would like to take a temperature reading right now. Your MCU will stop counting its seconds. It will go do whatever work you've asked it to do, and then it will come back and pick up exactly where it left. So your receive window is arbitrarily open at some time unknown to anyone else but that device. So any downlink messages you were trying to get to that device have evaporated. There will be a lot of engineers banging their heads into the wall and trying to figure out why the hell is this device not, under, not hearing my downlink command? And it's because you're, they're not mindful of the interrupts. The LoRaWAN stacks, and when I talk about the LoRaWAN stack, I'm purely talking about what's in the middle there, the Mac layer. Those are open source projects that are available from companies like Semtech, who owns the IP for the hardware, and other hardware companies. And so it's open source. You can take it, add your application on top, compile it, and be on your merry way. There are no guardrails. It's not a library that's compiled with a whole bunch of functions that say, I, I will take care of you, kind of like uh, the Zig talk that we had yesterday where you can make a lot of mistakes and you will not know that you're making them until they're a huge problem. That's what's happening here. So these open source stacks are reference code, but many developers are bringing them on as golden code. And that is a big, big, big problem. And not everyone is an expert in LoRa. So this is, and, and I shouldn't say LoRa, because I think this is true across all of these LP WAN and a lot of wireless protocols in general, is that you as the software application developer are not an expert in necessarily in the Mac layer for that particular protocol, and you're gonna take a lot of things for granted, and I'm here to warn you, <laughs> please do not take those things for granted. You have to learn a lot about your wireless protocol before you go and implement it. Um, so that's, that's one of the biggest things, and we'll get into a little bit more of this as we talk about platforms, but as you choose your protocol, the maturity of that protocol is also really important. Um, perhaps there are better guardrails for something like BLE, but LoRa is only a couple years old, and we're still figuring out all the interesting aspects of the physics and the hardware timing and the software timing and all of these lessons learned that are going, they're going to be lessons experienced first before they are lessons learned. So um, there's a lot of work being done right now to try to improve that. Let's see, okay. So moving up a level, um, let's talk about the network architecture for LoRaWAN. So we've talked, up until now, we've purely talked about the end nodes, the devices on that, uh, on the, your far left. And some of the, just some interesting things about LoRa and what makes it really easy. Um, we've talked about some things that make it complex, but let's talk about what makes it easy. There's no pairing process for devices. So you'll see here, it's a star of stars topology. And what that means is that that yellow water meter 
its packet can be carried by any gateway within reachable distance. It is the network server up in the cloud that has all of the intelligence to deduplicate all of those messages coming in and provide to the application server only one version of the multiple messages that it heard. And generally speaking, it'll choose the one with the best um, signal strength to ensure the efficacy of that packet. So um, this topology also helps from a security perspective um, because any gateway will pass any LoRa packet, um, theoretically you could do a DDoS attack on just one gateway, but that gateway will saturate and it will only pass so many things to the network server. And because theoretically you have multiple paths from your device through the network, it's resilient in that way. You can take down a single concentrator or a single node and the network maintains its uh, network maintains its efficacy. Um, other interesting things, the gateway uh, is, an, is a bridge. It's a, it's a dumb gateway for now, um, where it takes an RF package and transforms it to IP and it goes IP over the, over the internet. Very simple. Um, you can have open or private networks in this topology. So LoRaWAN is developed for open. Um, places like the Netherlands have blanketed the entire country with LoRaWAN. And so there's little to no cost for a solution provider um, like Sensoterra, who is an interesting company like Terralytic that does soil moisture detection and so if they want to deploy a f their sensors to a farm in the Netherlands, they've got ubiquitous coverage. That is a public network. You can deploy LoRaWAN in a private setting as well. Right now, there are uh, available gateways that can run the network server on the gateway itself. That's gonna, it's going to be a little bit more of an expensive proposition from your personal perspective. That's a private LoRa network. Um, that gateway will receive a packet. If it doesn't have the right network ID at the front end, it'll just drop it. So that's a private network. All right. All right, so I'm going to very uh, quickly cover some use cases. So supply chain and logistics, there are interesting things that are being done from um, ST Microelectronics has this really cool GNSS tracker. And what it does is you can attach it to an asset. It, when it has um, LoRa connectivity, it will take the GNSS, which is just a European version of GPS, it'll take those coordinates and pass them through LoRa and deliver the location of that asset. When it is off the LoRa network, it's smart enough to know that it's not connected, it will retain the GPS coordinates and when it reconnects at the other end, it will just download all of that information to, um, to the local gateway and you will know where that device has been the entire path. And that device also measures temperature so you could do something like a cold chain application. Metering, um, you know, gas and electric meters are, are one of the first adopters of LoRa because you can cover an entire city with very few gateways. They're only transmitting a couple bytes once every 15 minutes or frankly probably um, a couple times a day to tell, the, to tell uh, the gas company what your current usage is. Very, very broad um, applications. My favorite one is probably, I have to decide between smart city and agriculture. So in transportation, so many cool things you can do with LoRa to, um, to track um, buses and subways. Because one thing we didn't talk about is that LoRa has really good underground penetration because of the interesting modulation and the, um, the frequency band that it uses, you can get underground. So I, want, I really want to know when the Broad Street Line is going to be coming to my stop. So you can get, you can get these beacon transmissions through LoRa and propagate them um, through very, very difficult materials. Um, industrial is another interesting application. So industry um, IIoT, so industry IoT or in industry 
pick your nomenclature, is a really cool application for LoRa because these are environments that are unfriendly to a 2.4 or 5 gigahertz signal just purely because of the materials that are there. And so you can do really interesting things like um, preventive maintenance monitoring. So we talked about things like very simple temperature, humidity, sensors, but you can do really cool edge compute stuff in that you can have a, a connected, a power, AC power connected device that does a lot of really deep computation. Um, if you are measuring vibration of a motor, you have to sample it some very many times per second in order to get uh, an understanding of, of the model of that, um, of that engine, and then you have to compare it to some learned set of data, and you can do all that on the edge, and that's a lot of, it's a lot of edge processing. But you can use LoRa because at the end of the day, the only thing you need to transmit up is, I'm working, I need maintenance, or I'm down. Those are the only thing, three things you need to transmit, and LoRa is a great application for that. So you're doing all of this deep um, math, <laughs> Fourier transforms, and all kinds of interesting math at the edge, but you're only sending up the very critical information that you need to alert on. You need to tell somebody to go look at that machine, but you've done a, a lot of work at the edge to do that. Um, so here are some interesting, um, just other interesting applications. A uh, cool company called PNI does uh, connected parking sensors through LoRa, and, um, and that's just a really cool application for people who hate running around looking for open parking spots. <laughs> um, you can have a mobile app that tells you in that giant garage there's this one spot open and you can find it. I think we talked about Sensoterra and um, Terralytic is another similar one. Uh, Pannoni, which is a local Philadelphia company, they do infrastructure monitoring on, on bridges and, and all of, the, I, I'm scared to know what kind of data they're getting from our local infrastructure and probably will not drive on it again if I knew. But they're doing some really cool stuff. Um, oh, pest control. I'm an animal lover, so it hurts me a little bit. But um, if you have a mouse infestation and you put out a trap, you're probably not going to go check that trap every day. But if you don't check that trap every day and a poor little critter has met its end in your trap and it sits there for many days or weeks, you're going to have a very unpleasant experience uh, when you do find it. So Victor Mousetraps, which is the original mousetrap, has uh, built a better mousetrap. They've built a connected mousetrap. And so it, it's a completely different form factor in that it's a closed system, so it's, it's probably fl friendlier to people like myself. It's a closed system, and when you have what they call a kill, um, which is exactly what pops up in your mobile app, is a kill, <laughs> it, it sends a push notification to your mobile app the instant that it happens. And you can go um, and take care of that. that. This really is intended for your pest control company or for very large commercial applications where, for instance, the Sheridan may have hundreds of these traps distributed all over the hotel. And nobody is going to go check every single one. But someone has a mobile app. And instantaneously, they know precisely where to go and clean up whatever mess has been made and move on with their lives. And these are completely reusable um, traps. Interestingly enough, though, so these are, again, closed systems, $40, whatever, mousetraps. Interestingly enough, though, we're running through this use case where they're taking the old school wood mousetrap, which is not allowed to be used in California, by the way, for more animal-loving people. Um, and you can attach a LoRa um, sensor to it in that you connect the circuit when the trap hits, and that just, the connection of that circuit will send a beacon up to the clouds. So you can take a 50 cent mouse trap and put a disposable LoRa implementation on it, and you've just built the better original mouse trap. Really interesting applications. And that's, by the way, that's like a, it's like a $3 implementation of LoRa. Okay, 
So now we get into my favorite topic, IoT platforms. So the first thing we need to do is define what an IoT platform is because this is a word that has been taken over by anyone and everyone in the space. Everyone will tell you they run a platform. The sensor companies will tell you they run a platform. The network companies will certainly tell you they run a platform. AWS, Azure will tell you they run IoT platforms. Um, so will data analytics companies. Everyone has an IoT platform. But really, at the end of the day, what anybody cares about is did the bits from the bottom make it all the way to the top and generate some value for me? That's what I care about. Everything in the middle is the necessary evil for me to get to what I really want, which is value. So this is how we define an IoT platform. It's everything, it's end to end. Now, in 2019, a lot of it stops at that data management layer and the data analytics are a little bit thin, right? So everyone claims they can do data analytics and it will start to be applied as we, um, as we evolve the IoT journey. And there are, there, fairly, there are some companies that already do some analytics in the cloud. There's a company called H2O Degree, that's a local company, and um, based on the data that comes back from their water meters, they can tell you if you have a small leak or a large leak, and the likelihood of where that might be. They, can, they know the signature of a toilet leak versus a giant tub flood. flood. So there are some levels of data analytics that are happening, but not at that mecca level of, hey, Samsung, just close my refrigerator door. <laughs> Perhaps that's not, that's the automated action that, that is just now starting to take it. And I think this is why um, perhaps we're rolling down in that trough of disillusionment because people are realizing that having your lights turn on and off is really cool for like a week. And then it's not that cool anymore. What I really want is not to be able to turn the lights on and off from my app. I want my house to know what lighting settings I like at any given time of day and any given mood that I'm in. So we're getting there, but it's gonna take a lot more. And the importance is the integration between all these pieces. So um, I got this somewhere on the internet. I couldn't remember where, so it's just some, some really intelligent person <laughs> on the internet um, wrote about this. It's just because something is standardized doesn't mean it'll work. You can buy a Wi-Fi device on Amazon for very little money. What is the likelihood that it's gonna work really well? You spend a little more money on like a Belkin device, that's gonna work a lot better. So as we, as we look back at our network diagram, we're realizing that everybody has their implementation of how this is gonna work. So you've got companies A through N making devices. There are a lot of people making devices. You've got some smaller number of companies making gateways and they're interpreting LoRaWAN differently. So how, how I decide to implement the join procedure on my device might be slightly different than how the network server company wants to hear that join request and it might be, they may be sending down a join accept that's different than what I'm expecting to hear. So, Again, there's a protocol, there's a standard, but everyone interprets it just a little bit differently. And in this wireless world where you're sending one message up with 11 bytes and you're listening for 400 milliseconds, that could be the make or break for your implementation. Do you have an IoT device? Do you have a connected smart thing? Or do you just have a thing with a bunch of chips in it? So my my unicorn, <laughs> my IoT mecca, looks like this, where there is, I don't wanna say one company, because I don't think that's realistic, but that where there are really strong partnerships, meaning there are humans talking to other humans through some 
method, whether preferably in person or you know, over WebEx, or somehow collaborating very deliberately, not relying on a written standard that can be interpreted in many different ways. You, you need that written standard so that you have a common language, but you need to speak the same sentences at the same time so that that language makes sense. So you have devices of every variety, and this is not restricted to LoRaWAN. You have LoRa, you have Wi-Fi, you have cellular, you have Bluetooth. All of those things have some gateway connectivity. They all have some kind of network, but at the cloud level, they, should all, they all need to get integrated because I am one human being. I don't need 18 different versions of information coming at me all at once. Those all need to get integrated. Theoretically, I'd like to manage all of my IoT devices in one spot. And I want to do some analytics on not only the data, the sensor data, but even the device data. I want to do some analytics. I, I might be able to know something about my environment based on how my RSSI or signal noise ratio changes in a particular uh, device. So you could do data analytics not just on the sense data, but also on the metadata from the devices. And I want that to give me some level of intelligence so I can realize value and maybe that intelligence might be too late. And so I also want some automated action to happen just because humans are slow. So I don't necessarily want it to depend on me. I want something to automatically happen. And you may get a LoRa device that senses the information to trigger another device on Wi-Fi to take some action. Those things need to be able to work together. But this is definitely the unicorn. This takes a whole lot of collaboration across the IoT world. And I think once we get to that plateau of, of uh, productivity, this is the type of thing you'll see. But this is probably years, years out. Um, I will say that at Machine Q, we are working towards at least the, the LoRa version of this top-down integration. We are deeply looking at the device stack and optimizing it to work through our gateway software and to efficiently talk to our network server so that you tie that connectivity all the way through. You don't have different piece parts trying to speak the same language but missing each other. So we're really looking to enable true connectivity so that maybe we can get to the point where engineers can purely focus on those applications. Don't worry about the connectivity. You shouldn't have to worry about the connectivity. That's where you get true ubiquitous coverage and connectivity is when most people just focus on building the applications and the really cool use cases and how can we deploy this and deliver value as opposed to spending most of your time going, crap, why is it that I can't get this damn device to stay on the network? So I will leave you with this. Um, diversity is key to success. And um, that's true on so many levels. And especially when it comes to IoT, if you really want to be fully connected and get the most value out of those connected devices, you're going to have to play together with a whole bunch of different protocols. And that is it, and we are open for questions. All right, let's see. Here we are. All right. Okay, what are the things required to set up basic $3 LoRa-based device? So um, a couple of ways that you can implement LoRa from a hardware perspective right now. Um, there are companies like Murata that offer a uh, module. And it is just about everything you need to equip your device with LoRa, with the exception of the antenna. So you just add an antenna. And that, at really large scale numbers, that will run you about $7. If you want to get down to the $3 mark, that's going to be a chip down design. And there is a bunch of reference designs out there, Semtech having one of them. Um, the really super low cost is a transmit only 
device, um, which makes me really nervous because then you never know whether or not you're on the network. But this is a transmit-only device is something like the mouse trap that we talked about. So for three dollars, a device wakes up, sends a message into the ether, and hopes really hard that it makes it to where it needs to be. Um, but that's all it does. So that's why you get a three dollar device. So um, Again, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me, but that is, that's called the ultra low power design. Uh, it's something that we at Machine Q have, uh, but it's, it's, that's the type of uh, implementation that you're gonna get at the $3 level. Okay. Who owns or manages LoRa base stations, users or dedicated providers? Um, that is up to you. So um, with Machine Q, for instance, we, manage those base stations, the gateways, um, and that's a service that we provide. You have full visibility in, in that network, so when you log into our um, MQ Central account, you will see, in your account, you will see the health of all of your gateways, and you will see the transmissions from all of your devices, so you can manage it in that respect. But you can, um, if you go to a company like, um, TTN and, and multi-tech, you're pretty much on your own. So you, you manage those by yourself. Those are great starters. Um, even though I think it's awesome to get started on Machine Q, we offer a ton of help and services. Um, but if you're gonna go full up production, if you're gonna do a real deployment, worrying about base stations is gonna eat up whatever profit you'll ever make in your, <laughs> in your company. So you'd probably want to, to work with, uh, with a provider to deploy your network. Um, but um, you, ca you, can, uh, you can manage um, your own base stations. I should say, um, within Machine Q, you own your gateways. So if, if you wanna deploy to a remote location, um, you fully own those gateways and you can, um, you can manage them yourself. Okay. Um, what difficulties have you run into with sampling data and filtering that data before sending the small crucial data using LoRa? Um, that's a better question for a device developer. Um, but I will tell you that the biggest difficulties that, that we found is having sufficient hardware resources on a device and managing those appropriately. Um, it's not really the difficulty of the application, like how hard is the math to do, but are you coexisting with your wireless protocol correctly? Um, those, are, those I think are the hardest pieces. Um, let's see. How did you get started in IoT? <laughs> I was looking for a job in Philadelphia. I didn't know Comcast was a technology company. And then um, I met a few people and uh, I started working at Xfinity Home. And I just, I landed in IoT and I've been in love with it ever since. Uh, let's see, can a system have many types of networks protocol, network protocols in it? Um, depends, again, we were, what do you mean by system necessarily? Um, so can an IoT deployment have many protocols in it? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's a matter of the very top end, the applications that are receiving that data, are those integrated? You'll be hard pressed to find fully integrated applications today where it will take your Wi-Fi, LoRa, whatever other data and integrate it all at once. Um, something like Azure IoT Hub has the ability to ingest whatever kind of data you give it. And you can take and store that data in a database and, and everything's fine, but what you'll find is that it's not normalized. So the temperature and humidity data you get off of your Zigbee device might be different than the temperature and data you get off of your LoRa device. And frankly, that could happen across LoRa devices. What we're working to do is normalize that data. So in my unicorn slide, normalization is one of those things. So when a device sends you temperature, it is always, for instance, degrees C with 
two decimal point precision, as opposed to whatever that manufacturer decided that their temperature was going to be measured in, and then you get this mish mismatch of data that you can't really do anything with. Um, but to answer the, the question very plainly, I hope <laughs> that we get to a point where a system can have any kind of protocol you want in it. Let's see. Laura uses unlicensed frequencies. Is there one that uses licensed frequencies perhaps to help with global deployment? Um, even licensed frequencies are not consistent across the world. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, probably cellular is the closest I'd come because just because the cellular companies um, try to take care of that for you, um, but I would say no. Right now, global deployment really ends up being on the application to be able to navigate all of the different, be able to account for all of the different um, frequencies. Um, what types of projects do your software engineers work on at Machine Q? Oh my gosh, so many. So everything from embedded software development for devices. So we have a couple engineers at Machine Q that develop, um, that have developed MQ Stack, which is in its alpha version right now, where we, like I said, we implemented LoRaWAN from our perspective. And so we think that that's a really strong stack. We've added a whole lot of guard the rails to help people not mess up the timing. And we've got folks working on gateway software and backend infrastructure and um, middleware and front end. So pretty much almost any level of development you want to do, um, we have at Mission Q. Um, can you repeat the max recommended ranges again? Um, do you mean, does that mean the, the distance that Laura can travel? Yes. Yes, okay. So in urban environments, you're looking at maybe quarter mile. And in rural environments, like a farm, 10, 20 kilometers. It's really, um, it's really about what's in the way. Um, OK, last, we'll just go with the last one here. What are the standards for encryption in the LoRa ecosystem? So I will, oops, let me go back to this slide, and you will, you will see it here. So um, AES-128 is across the board from uh, the minute that it leaves the sensor. And that's true across, all the way across. And then each hop is differently encrypted. So the gateways to the network server can be TLS. Um, ours is over um, VPN. If uh, then from the network server forward again, TLS, SSL, that's the, this is the current encryption model. And I think that is it. All right. Any other questions? I stand between you and lunch, I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.